So good afternoon, brothers. Uh, my name is Dionysius Protopapadakis. I'm the Director of Graduate Engagement for Phi Gamma Delta. First and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for being in attendance for our virtual housing conference in 2021. Uh, I'd also like to thank our presenters for today. Uh, we have representation from Columns Fundraising, Upper Crust Food Service, CSL Management, as well as Holmes Murphy Insurance. Uh, the way the conference platform will work today is as follows. Uh, the opening session, which you are all currently in, uh, is in a webinar format. So please utilize the chat box if you need to do so. Uh, due to time restraints, questions that are asked during this opening session will be saved and asked during the closing session. Each session after the welcome will be in a regular Zoom call format to allow for interaction between the presenters and the attendees. So please utilize the conference program uh, that's been provided to you. Please be sure to self mute in those breakout sessions and have your camera on if possible to allow for more engagement. Uh, during the closing session, we will have time for a question and answer session in which you'll be allowed to ask your questions directly to members of the 1848 Housing Committee. Now brothers, I'd like to introduce our first speaker to kick off the conference, Steve Bocker, Denver, 1983. Steve currently serves as the chairman of 1848 Properties Incorporated and the 1848 Housing Committee. His prior volunteer roles include president of the Denver Graduate Chapter, member and president of the Board of Chapter Advisors at Colorado School of Mines, and member of the House Corporation at the University of Denver and Colorado School of Mines. Professionally, Steve is associated with marketing and holds the title of president and owner of Catch Fire Marketing, LLC, located in Greenwood Village, Colorado. Steve, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dio. Appreciate it. Brothers, welcome to our housing conference. I'm so excited. Uh, we have uh, 84 brothers uh, registered for this event, representing about 41 different chapters. And uh, we have a great program set up for you today. Um, let's take a quick look at uh, the highlights of what we're going to accomplish today. Dio, if you'll. So we have a couple uh, uh, five, five things on our agenda. One, we're going to give you just a quick overview of the 1848 housings plan. We have a presentation from our Archon president on the state of the fraternity. We have a terrific keynote address uh, that I'm most excited about for you to hear from uh, uh, Brother Dave Schrack. Um, and then we have um, breakout sessions. We have actually eight different sessions um, on a variety of topics that are going to help you achieve more in 2021. And then in our closing uh, session, we're going to be talking about resources that are available uh, to help you operate your house corporation as well as a question and answer period. So we have a full agenda for you today. So I'm gonna move quickly into just a summary of, of our housing plan so that you understand the work that the 1848 housing group um, is doing. First, I just, I really wanted to share an underlying kind of uh, statement, which is in, 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 that we operate from, which is maintaining status quo really in housing means you're moving backwards. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, obviously your houses are aging. Um, so um, your houses are aging. Um, the community uh, on uh, college campuses are advancing housing. They're spending millions and millions of dollars upgrading their housing. The uh, private sector in many campuses is um, building new complexes. So if we're just maintaining the status quo, if we're just sort of operating at a basic level, we're really moving backwards in the marketplace. And so um, uh, with that kind of uh, underlying sense, uh, the purpose of 1848 is to help our house corporations prepare for a better future. What's included in our housing plan? Well, First, uh, most of you may know, some of you may not, but uh, the Archons voted in October to make housing a strategic initiative of their fraternity, and they approved our five-year plan. Um, this, uh, some of the highlights of that plan include the creating and hiring of a staff position, director of housing. Uh, it includes uh, the development of, of programs such as a national property insurance program, um, and maybe national services that you can opt into to take away some of the burden of operating a house corporation. So maybe that'll include things like payroll or accounting. 
um, maybe uh, discounted internet. Uh, we're working on developing those concepts. Um, we have a, a variety of things focused on improving the quality and frequency of graduate communications. Uh, that's real important. And you'll hear some of that talked about in some of the sessions coming up. And of course, focusing on safety and improving the member experience in respect to housing. So that's just a quick overview of uh, the things that 1848 Housing is working on. We're excited um, to uh, uh, be doing this work and uh, we look forward to getting your input throughout the day to day. Uh, and of course you can reach out to us anytime um, through um, the links on the uh, website um, that give you uh, access to our contact information. One thing that I wanna do is uh, issue a warning. Um, some of, all of us come from different places and um, the challenge that we are throwing out to you is that we want you to become better than you are today. Some of you are excellent today and we're excited about that. And uh, for those of you that are excellent, we want you to become incredible. And for those of you that maybe are operating um, well, but could be operating um, better, we want that for you as well. So know that we, uh, as you hear these presentations, uh, we have a, a huge variety of, of experience and expertise and operating excellence represented. So don't, uh, don't be um, offended if this is too basic for you. Um, our, our intent is to try to uh, make presentations that are relevant to everyone. And in my experience, right, there's always something that you can take away from any presentation. Okay, so with that said, I'm excited to uh, introduce um, um, our con president, Nick Lewacano, Illinois, 1974. Nick has served on the Archon uh, board since 2016. He served four years as treasurer. Nick's service to the fraternity is uh, varied. He has been um, uh, on house corporation boards. He has been on board of chapter advisors. He's served on the financial advisory board. Um, I can tell you that uh, I've had uh, time to interact with Nick um, at the last several um, academies and ecclesi, I guess that's the right term. And uh, um, uh, he's a big supporter of housing. So without further ado for a state of the fraternity address, uh, let me turn this over to Nick. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, as the case may be. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes of your time this morning. And thank you all for joining us, by the way. I think this is an excellent program that we have in front of us. And I hope that you all enjoy it and learn a lot from it. Um, I'm going to cover the current state of affairs of the fraternity. I can tell you up front, the headline is things remain very good for us. If you had the opportunity to uh, read the, my message in the magazine that came out uh, in December, early January. Uh, there were five things that I talked about, and I'm going to reprise those five things, but give you a little more flavor, a little more detail for what's going on with regard to each one of those five things, uh, because they're all important to us. First of all, COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 is not what we would describe as a strategic issue, but it is a huge tactical issue. When the COVID situation arrived, we had no idea what to expect except the disruption could be financially and operationally enormous for us. So when it came time to set the annual budget for the fraternity uh, for the fiscal year that we are in, we set the revenue budget at 75% of historical. Uh, however, the truth of the matter is that we had no idea whether uh, uh, how much was going to come in our coffers as a result of the pandemic. So the truth of the matter was that the revenue in actuality could have been anywhere from zero of historical amounts to 100%. We just did not know. So the 75% was a guess, it turned out to be a good one. The early indications are that we are tracking at around 75% of historical levels. 
Um, we have found that fall recruitment has been stable for the undergraduate chapters and expenses for the international headquarters have been very, very well managed in no large or no small part due to the emergence of an application of technology such as the Zoom session that we're holding today. Similarly, my understanding is that almost all the house corporations did an excellent job of managing the situation. And so things are, they're very well in hand. At this point, uh, the pandemic is certainly not the meltdown that it could have been. And we think we will emerge in a position of strength, but it will take some time to assess the impact upon our overall business model, particularly because we're getting this wave uh, that is showing up now. And when you have 12 to 15% testing rates across the country, uh, we, we know we still have a ways to go. So it'll take time to assess the impact upon the business model. We'll remain cautious financially, uh, but I can tell you participation levels are still very, very, very high. We had uh, an incredible Fiji Academy two weeks ago, 928 brothers at all levels of participation signed up for it. So we were very, very pleased and I thought it was a great meeting that we had. The other four items that I'll talk about are more on the strategic side. First is diversity, which is a very complex issue. Uh, it's a strategic issue for us and it's strategic simply because it is critical that we stay in touch with our customer base. Our customer base in this case is the undergraduate uh, contingent and the campuses which those undergraduates serve and from whom they draw their uh, pool of re recruits and new brothers. Uh, the, the situation there simply is that we live in a, a campus environment that has changing demographics. The world has become more globalized, technical revolution that allows people to communicate like we are communicating right now, whether they're down the street or on the other side of the planet has come upon us. And we have a very large social environmental impact that people are considering, not to mention the politics of all of that. So the way I look at this is very simple. And that is when it comes to diversity, it is <clears throat> a that time has come. Uh, we are in a position where we can stand more diversity, uh, but we need to have a broader participation in our ranks going forward. Put it simply, if you have a chapter whose compass is set on due north, the cap campus with which it's associated is headed towards the Northeast. Today, there won't be much of a problem because those two vectors are pretty close together. But as time goes on, those two lines will diverge and the chapter will be seen as increasingly irrelevant or anachronistic. Uh, so diversity is a, is, a, is a good thing. The trick for us is to improve diversity and maintain our values at the same time. As I said in my remarks in the magazine, uh, it, as long as we maintain these values, we should not really care where somebody comes from, what they look like or what language they speak uh, when it comes to joining our fraternity. We should be welcoming them. There is a committee in place, which was also highlighted in the magazine to make a recommendation as to how we would go about achieving diversity. Um, and we remain 100%, we being the archons, remain 100% in support of this initiative. I expect we will have conversations about how we go about implementing our diversity efforts. Uh, and the, uh, the focus on diversity is really a three-part effort. First is strategy. That's what we're trying to do right now. Next will come the implementation phase in which we talk about exactly what it is we're going to do to achieve improved diversity. And then lastly, the execution piece, because you can have great plans, but if you can't pull them off, uh, they're not going to help you very much. So uh, those are the things ahead of us with regard to diversity. And in a parallel effort, we have also impaneled a group that is examining our ritual. Uh, to make sure that uh, the, the ritual remains welcoming to everybody that we welcome into our midst. The next item to talk about is hazing. Hazing is an issue that is still with us to res resolve. And I've been thinking about this for a long time as to why we still have this issue with us and we need to work on it still. Uh, one of the things I think about is that hazing and somehow I think is related to an imbalance in the power dynamic between an active member of the fraternity and the pledge. In other words, people could only be doing this because they're seeing the pledge to be in some sort of subservient position to the uh, fully initiated brothers. Uh, if you continue to have that kind of a, a perspective on our fraternity life, I don't see how inclusion, diversity and inclusion is going to work because you're not fully appreciating, you're not fully welcoming uh, someone as long as you're not seeing them on the same level as you. So the two, I think, come kind of hand in hand. And we're going to have to pay a lot of attention as we go forward to continuing to resolving the hazing issue. The frequency of, of closures has quickened 
uh, within the fraternity. We've closed, I think, 14 chapters within the last couple of years. Uh, the actions of a few are affecting many people, and I don't think that is fair. Uh, what we need to do is to improve our messaging and provide incentives, both positive and negative, uh, to, to stop this once and for all. And lastly, there is a strong correlation with alcohol violations that occurs when we come upon a hazing situation. Uh, and not all situations where you have um, alcohol does hazing occur, but when hazing occurs, we usually find that alcohol has been a factor. Last one, or next to last one, is housing as an experience. Uh, that's what we're talking about today. I think it's very, very uh, wise for us and, and very important for us to enrich the undergraduate experience through improving the housing situation. Uh, we did have, as many of you know, a proposal put forth by the Archons at the last Ecclesia uh, to fund this effort more fully, and that failed. I think that one of the reasons it failed is that we have maybe three different categories of housing. We have people who operate, or chapters that are operating in private chapter houses, meaning either we own the houses or we lease them from somebody who owns the house. There are university controlled housings and there are chapters that don't have any housing associated with their chapter operations. So we have to find a way to, uh, to target the right audience here, the house corporations such as yourself, and make sure that we are able to provide the worthwhile services that are contemplated by what the brothers with 1848 are, are doing. I think it's a tremendously worthwhile priority. It remains a strategic priority for the fraternity. We do need to find a funding mechanism that will enable us to do more. And the financial outlook of the fraternity needs to stabilize before we can address some of the more thorny issues about how to redirect funds or come up with funds to continue this effort. Lastly, courageous leadership. Uh, this is the fundamental mission for us. What we're trying to do here is provide tools for later success for our undergraduates. Uh, I always like to point out that courageous leadership is not just for formal leaders, elected leaders, or people who are influencers within an organization. Courageous leadership can evolve at a point in time where someone who is classified as a follower stands up and says, no, we should not do that, or this is the direction we need to go in. That in and of itself is a leadership activity. It's just standing up for our values. We need to encourage this and we can't lose sight of the mission as we go forward. Courageous leadership is very, very important for us because if we can't accomplish this mission, we will not be able to address the issues that we're focused on with regard to hazing, risk management, or diversity. So those are the five things that we're working on right now. In summary, I think we are in very, very good shape. We look forward to continued progress. As we resolve these issues over time, our priorities will uh, change. Some will be reordered and new ones will come along and we will embrace those and we will solve them as well. So thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, th those are my comments on where we are. Again, I think we're in very, very good shape. I look forward to listening to the rest of the program and learning uh, everything that I can about where we're going with our property management efforts and our housing corporation efforts. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Nick. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today and the leadership that you're giving um, the international fraternity. Um, so uh, thank you, appreciate it. Brothers, uh, I'm excited uh, to uh, introduce the next uh, session to you. It's our keynote address. It's uh, uh, from a brother that I've gotten to uh, know over the last couple of years as he's uh, uh, engaged 1848 housing um, in his efforts uh, with Kansas State. Um, Brother Shrek is uh, a founder of his chapter, um, Kai Deuteron. Uh, he has served in a variety of capacities uh, over the years, ranging from Archon Counselor to Purple Legionnaire. Uh, he's been president of the Atlanta Graduate Chapter. He's been a House Corporation president um, so his involvement with the fraternity has uh, uh, been steady during uh, his post uh, initiated or his graduate years. Um, Dave's got a great professional background, largely in food service, bakery, catering, restaurant operations. He spent 16 years with the Starbucks Coffee Company in a variety of capacities, ending um, his ending years, including regional food and beverage manager and district manager for the company. 
Uh, Dave's married uh, to his college sweetheart for 50 years um, and has two daughters, six grandchildren. Um, he's got an inspiring message that um, I hope uh, you'll enjoy. Um, and so let me turn it over to Brother Shrek. So Steve, I hope you can hear me. Uh, good morning, brothers. Uh, my name is Dave Shrek. Uh, as Steve said, I'm a 1969 graduate of Kansas State University. Uh, I am honored to have been one of the 24 founders of the Chi Deuteron chapter at Kansas State in 1968. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the experience that I've had in the last two years of working with the House Corporation at Kansas State and then to present so, an idea, a, a template of ideas for you to consider as you work through your individual situations, because I'm sure they'll be very different than mine. I have served uh, the fraternity in a lot of different ways, but uh, never my chapter that much. Um, I was a, a typical Fiji brother out of the 51 pig dinners that we've had at uh, Kansas State. I probably attended 46 of them. Uh, I always went, I always sat in on the House Corporation meetings and uh, I always wished them well, but I was never really involved until two years ago in November of 2018, almost three years ago now, uh, I got a call or I got an email from the House Corporation president who sent me a copy of the Health Department inspection report that we had our own cook and um, they were not doing well. They were failing the health department inspections. He asked me to take a look at it and give him feedback on what I thought. I told him that what I thought was that um, they were gonna get closed uh, because uh, it was a mess. So I decided to fly up to Kansas City and uh, one of my fraternity brothers and I, uh, Alan Schweitzer, drove over to Manhattan so that I could actually see the kitchen. Having worked for Starbucks coffee for 16 years, I understood what a clean restaurant looked like. Uh, it was a mess. And while I was there, I learned from several of the brothers that that wasn't our only challenge. We faced financial issues. We faced house mother issues. We faced property repair and maintenance issues. Uh, we faced um, issues with occupancy. So it very pretty quickly it was a, it was suggested to me that the current president, who was really overwhelmed by his responsibilities, he, he's a very successful businessman in Manhattan. He's been in Manhattan over 30 years. He uh, has not only his uh, main business, but he also uh, manages apartment properties. He has a family, he has children and grandchildren, but he, the duties of a, of a house corporation president were literally overwhelming him. And it was suggested to me that if I went to him and offered to become the president, that he would agree with me on that. I, I've known the man over 40 years. I went to him, we had a very frank and honest conversation. And he agreed to step down because he said he just was really overwhelmed. Uh, I'm retired, so I retired six and a half years ago, so I have the time. Uh, the, the first thing that I had to do is I had to determine exactly what my situation was. Uh, what I found out was that uh, our house mother, who was 89 years old and had been in the position 19 years, she had cancer, she was uh, not on the property very much, and she was really providing very little adult presence in the house. The food service operation was not working. Men were allowed to go into the kitchen 24 hours a day, do whatever they wanted. If the chef didn't show up or if the cook didn't show up, they'd go in and fix their own food. So it was a recipe for failure. Um, our finances were dire. Basically, we had no money. For the past 15 years, we have been focusing on paying off our mortgage. Our original mortgage was $900,000. We had it down to $30,000, but we were cash poor. As a result, 
We couldn't maintain the house. We couldn't repair the house. We couldn't pay our vendors on time. We were extremely strapped. As Warren Buffett says, at the end of the day, it's all about money. And we didn't have any. Uh, occupancy was, it was projected to be only 13 men moving into a 52-man house uh, the following fall. Occupancy was dropping. Uh, as the CEO of a small business, a, an apartment business basically is, we had to figure out what our plan was and we had no plan. So working with the, now I did have 13 members on the house corporation board. So I was very fortunate. I knew all these men, um, they, many professionals, but I started getting together with them. I started reaching out to people that I knew, Bill Martin, Ben Robinson, other house corporation presidents at Phi Gamma Delta. I even knew the house corporation president for all the house corporations at Sigma Phi Epsilon. I reached out and I started asking what, what's important? What are the priorities? Uh, what should we be focusing on? And the, the thing that we decided to do was to create a strategic plan. Now, when I talk about creating a straight strategic plan, one of my heroes is Henry Kissinger, who is the Secretary of State and the National Security Advisor under Richard Nixon and then Gerald Ford. Uh, in his book, Kissinger, the Negotiator, he says that creating a strategy is looking at the end from the beginning. So I had to understand, first of all, where I'm at. What, are, what is my current situation? And once I defined that, I looked to the end and I said, what do we want to be? And I defined it and we defined it. And I put it to the house corporation and I told them, this is going to be, this is what we need to adopt as our strategic plan. So let me read the strategic plan to you because it's pro probably not different than anything that the fraternity or that you have talked about. The mission of the house corporation is to professionally, ethically and transparently manage a safe, healthy, comfortable, properly maintained and renovated, financially sound property in which the undergraduate members of Chi Deuteron chapter of Phi Gamma Delta may live while seeking to obtain a college education at Kansas State. We presented it to the, yes. to the House Corporation Board. They unanimously adopted it. And I insisted that every decision that we make had to be able to filter through this strategy. It had to be able to meet what we were trying to accomplish. We defined a three-year turnaround plan. In the first year, we would try to get 30 men in the house. In the second year, 40 men in the house, which is break even. And in the third year and from thereafter, 52 men, a full house. On the day that I became the president of the House Corporation, which was January 30th, 2019, our house mother passed away. I told the board that we were not going to get another house mother, we were going to get a resident advisor and I wanted a Fiji. Much to my surprise and delight, a gentleman by the name of Greg Nelson, who was on the board, reached out to me and told me that he was interested in filling that position. He's a 1979 graduate of Kansas State. He's a Fiji. And it, he, we began a conversation and I presented to the board that we wanted to hire Greg to become our house corporation resident advisor or our chapter house uh, resident advisor. He and his wife, Moved, sold their house in Kansas City, moved to Kansas State. And we renovated the property. And I'll tell you how we did that. We renovated the, the apartment and they moved in and they lived there 12 months out of the year. So now we have a Fiji resident advisor who can go anywhere in the house. He attends meetings. He sits in uh, and listens on in the J board meetings. He's there to provide adult uh, presence to advised to uh, support uh, the young men uh, in the chapter. The second thing that we needed to do is we needed to have a property manager. We needed to be able to repair, re, uh, to maintain, and to think about in the long term, uh, building, uh, improving our entire building. So I started reaching out to property managers in the city of Manhattan, Kansas, and. Uh, I found out that nobody really wanted to do this job. 
And then again, I was blessed. I uh, found out that we had a, a brother in Manhattan, Jeff Fowler, 93, who owned a property management company, the Wildcat Services of Manhattan. So we started meeting with Jeff. We negotiated a contract and he is now our property manager. He, he inspects the property monthly with the house manager. Uh, he uh, manages all the vendors to take care of repairs and maintenance. He takes and he manages all of our repair or our uh, vendor work during the summers when we have uh, property improvement uh, projects going on. He's there to ensure that we pass our uh, fire department inspections, uh, which are obviously very important. He's our property manager. Uh, we're very fortunate that he charges us for time and um, parts and so parts and labor. Uh, he does not um, charge us a great deal, but we are able to manage all of our uh, projects and taking care of the property because it's critical to the men who live in the house that the property be maintained. If the urinal's broken, we need to fix it immediately. And he's the man on the emergency contact list that they reach out to if they have not reached out to him through the um, through the house manager. The next thing that we wanted to do is to, I wanted to bring in a professional food management company. I was not interested in trying to have a chef or a cook. Now, that's just me. Having been in the, in the contract management business for many years, I wanted to get us out of the food business. I couldn't have men in the kitchen fixing food. We would never have a clean, safe operation that created good, nutritious uh, meals that the men really enjoyed. It was part of the experience. And it gave us a, a, a competitive differentiation over off-campus housing, although we are certainly in competition with fraternities and with on-campus housing. But food can be a very important part of the total experience. So I interviewed five contract food companies. For three months, I interviewed them. And uh, I, I will tell you that I'm a very difficult interviewer. I'm a very difficult person to please. Um, you might make me happy, but it's very difficult to please me because I want what we pay for. And I settled on uh, deciding to bring in Upper Crest, our um, uh, food service, preferred food service provider. I've been working with them for two years. It's not without challenges, but I know the food business. I have them report directly to me. Now, many of you don't have an undergraduate that understands the food business or someone on the board or a, re, a, a local grad that understands the food business. I insist that they report directly to me. I know the business. I, I was going to Manhattan every three months. I live in Atlanta. I was going to Manhattan every three months and inspecting the kitchen, meeting with the cook, talking about what his challenges are, what his opportunities are, what I see, talk to the men, get their feedback about the food operations. Uh, when there's a problem, the, the brothers call me and I talk to the food management company. We brought them on. And now we have a professional food manager. The next thing that I wanted to do was to provide support for the Purple Legionnaire. You know, there are three legs to the graduate support stool. Uh, one is the House Corporation, one is the Purple Legionnaire, and the third is the B, uh, Board of Chapter Advisors. We have no Board of Chapter Advisors. So the Purple Legionnaire, Chris Hupe, is who received the Durance Award this year, he's been doing this job for seven or eight years. He's the son of one of my pledge brothers, and he has a son in the house right now. He's very devoted, spends an enormous amount of time and hard work working with the undergraduates. And I wanted to provide him some, some support in the areas of recruitment, in the areas of scholarship, and in the areas of culture. Uh, the, when I went up to Manhattan in November of uh, 2018, uh, I had lunch with uh, Alan Schweitzer and with Chris Hupe. And 
Chris told me he had heard about a man named John Hatfield. I immediately went on LinkedIn and found him. His name is John Hatfield. He's the principal in a company called Brave Man Society. They are a, a consultant company that helps fraternities get turned around. He's a psychologist by trade and believe it or not, he lives in Manhattan, Kansas, although he works all over the country. So I reached out to him uh, first on LinkedIn, then on email, then I talked to him by phone. And on my next trip up to Manhattan, I met with him. Uh, we created a one-year contract for him to uh, help us strategize about those three areas, scholarship, um, recruitment, and uh, the, uh, trying to think of the word. Any, the, anyway, so we talked to him about that and he said, well, I want this much money to do this for a year. And I said, well, I'll give you half that much money, but if you, if we reach our occupancy goals and if we improve our scholarship, then I'll give you a bonus. So we agreed on that. And he works directly with the PL and with the chapter. Although the house corporation uh, paid for his fees, uh, his base fees. Uh, and although I talked to him, uh, we talked to each other two or three times a month, uh, he does not report to me. He works directly with the PL. That was our way of supporting the chapter without sticking our nose into chapter management business. The final thing that we decided that we had to do is we had to start living by the rules. We have chapter bylaws, we have chapter house policies, we have house corporation bylaws, we have con rental contracts. We weren't living by any of the rules. Men pretty much did what they want. There's a live-in clause in our, in our rental contract. Men were moving out. Uh, we had to part ways with some of the men that didn't care about living by the rules. One of the undergraduates told me, we don't like to follow rules. And I said, well, so what do you do? Do you run stop signs? Do you uh, punch the waitress in the nose if you're only 18 and she won't sell you a beer? There are rules. We have to follow the rules. And I've been very uh, straightforward about that. Now, let's talk about finances. As I said, we had no money. Uh, not only did we have no money, our, our mortgage wasn't that much. It was only $30,000. But... We also had a $50,000 credit line that we had taken out and used. And we were paying for that. In fact, I think we were paying interest only. Um, so I went to the bank and I presented our strategy and our tactical platforms to the bank. And they agreed. And it was pretty easy, really, because our property is worth far more than I wanted. But we agreed to refinance the, the mortgage up to $200,000. We took that money, we paid off the original mortgage, we paid off the credit line, and we used the rest of the cash to get us through the first year and a half because we were still losing money at this point. Um, since interest rates have gone so low, I've gone back in and uh, renegotiated lower interest rates so that uh, we're not paying as much, but we're basically paying $1,100 a month for the next 19 years. And I don't really care about that because I'm not really worried about that. I want to be able to have positive cash flow. So we needed that cushion. At the same time, Mike Morris, a brother in Dallas, who used to be on the Education Foundation, agreed to help me raise some money from some of the graduate brothers. And over a period of about 60 days, he raised about $60,000. That was what we referred to as the Alamo money, because if we had to fall back that was gonna be the money that was gonna protect us from going bankrupt. So when I presented this to the house corporation, there was some serious pushback on some issues. They weren't interested in us bringing in a resident advisor. They weren't interested in us paying a food service company. And I basically had to tell them, look, this is the way we're gonna do it. If you guys don't like it, one of you can be the president. Nobody wants to be the house corporation president. It's a tough job. During my first year, and I'm not exaggerating, guys, I probably worked 30 to 35 hours a week. 
managing the house corporation. I felt like I was back at Starbucks being a district manager or a regional director. This thing takes time, but it works for me because I'm retired. It's extremely difficult if you're trying to manage a career, a family, and the house corporation. The man agreed with me. We finally passed the tactical platforms that we were interested in. We brought in Greg Nelson as our resident advisor. We pay him a small salary, which can increase every year if scholarship reaches a certain point and if occupancy reaches a certain point. Our property manager is on every month with us. Our fraternity improvement consultant worked with us for a year and did the things that he was that he'd come to do. And now we use him on an as needed basis. He's very helpful. We have Upper Crest in managing our food business so that the house, the boys don't even wash dishes. Upper Crest takes care of the kitchen. Nobody's allowed in the kitchen, but Upper Crest and the four brothers that helped serve on Wednesday night dinners prior to chapter meeting. And we live by the rules now. So let me tell you what the results were. Number one, our occupancy in the first year was 30 men. This year, it was 42 men. Today, it's 46 men. In the fall, it's going to be 52 men. We're, pat we're cash flow positive. The chapter is cash flow positive. The fraternity co improvement consultant continues to work with us on rush and on scholarship. Our scholarship has improved five semesters in a row, and we were named by Fraternity and Sorority Life last year as being the best, in, the most improved chapter at Kansas State. So we got the results in two years. It was a three-year plan. We got the results in two years. So a month ago, I tendered my resignation for this job as House Corporation President on the 30th of this month. Why did I do that? Because i that's what I had come to do, was to help them design a turnaround plan and to execute it. We've done that. But I'm not stepping away from the chapter. I'm, I have since become the chair of the BCA and I have organized 15 men who work with me and the, and the Purple Legionnaire to achieve the third leg of graduate support for the chapter for the long run. We have a brand new president coming in. He's retired, important. He graduated in 77. He and his brother are both Fijis. His son was a Fiji. He had a very successful career in the milling industry working for ConAgra. And he was the president of a large board of operations. I mean, board of, uh, of um, directors of a, um, of a home for children with Down syndrome. He did that for 10 years. They had a $7 million budget. He just retired. So he applied for the position. I couldn't have found somebody better that will continue to follow the repeatable routine that we've come up with that will help us be successful year after year after year instead of the ups and downs that we're so dealing with. Now, after saying all that, let's talk about what template you might follow to help in your situation, because all of you have different situations. The very first thing that you need to do is to assess what is my situation? Is finances my problem? Or do I have multiple problems? Do I have kitchen problems, finance problems? Do I have property management problems? You have to understand, you have to talk with the brothers that are there now. You have to talk with the people that are on the ground that understand. I managed this from Atlanta. And until the pandemic, I was doing three, I was going to Manhattan every three months for uh, board meetings. But now I'm doing it on Zoom because this is what we have. Once you understand exactly what your situation is, you need to assess your team because if you don't have a Purple Legionnaire, you're in trouble. If you don't have a board of directors, you gotta find one. I had 13, 
I walked in the door and had 13 people. People that I knew all my life. It's very, very critical that you have a strong team. Bill Martin said to me when I talked to him about taking on this role, he said, share the load. You cannot do this work by yourself. Even then, it was almost overwhelming for me. Make sure that you understand your circumstances and who's on your team that can help you define. Here's where we are. Here's the strategy that we're going to adopt. That's articulating your conclusions and saying, this is what we want to become. This is how long it's going to take. These are our measurables that we have to reach each year in order for us to be able to prove to ourselves that our strategy is working. Occupants, I mean, remember, we're, we're running a, an apartment house. Occupancy, condition of the property, adult presence, food service. How are you comparing in achieving scholarship? Are we a positive part of the entire undergraduate experience? You have to decide what do you want? You have to define the end from the beginning. You have to share the strategy with all your, with the undergraduates, with the um, house corporation team, with the PL, with your banker, with your vendors. Everybody needs to know what it is because when we went out and started trying to get donations from the brothers, they said, what's the plan? Am I just throwing this money down a hole is there a, or is there a plan? Are we just getting you through this year or is there a plan? We articulated the plan to the graduates, all the graduates. And it, it made them feel comfortable that what we were doing was going to work. And we have proved that it works. You need to have this support. You need to have this team. There's going to be, I already talked about, so when you figure out what it is that you got to do, you can't do them all at once. You have to decide what you're going to fix first. You have to prioritize what your, what your, uh, what the issues are and how you're going to define, how you're going to solve them. It's not just what are we got, what have we got to do? How are we going to do it? And as I said, you have to define your milestones for success. You have to constantly communicate with the PL, with the House Corporation, with the undergraduates, with IHQ. You have to be able to commit to the time because time is difficult. It's very difficult. That's why I insisted that whoever take my place would be retired. You have to share the workload but you have to have leadership courage. And what do I mean by that? You have to be willing to be honest and direct without being a jerk or being rude. You have to be able to tell it like it is. And I'm gonna give you one example and then I'm gonna finish up. One of the things that I found out when we realized we had no money is I insisted that every bill that the fraternity turned in for payment. I had to approve it before I would submit it to the treasurer for payment. I really annoyed a lot of brothers with that. And I said, I don't care. If I don't know where the money is, if I don't know how we're gonna spend it, because I was just getting invoices. I would be, uh, I, I would be paying bills that I didn't know anything about. So, I was very direct. I was very difficult. And it didn't matter to me because we had to achieve financial independence. And then if your goals don't meet your expectations based on your timeline, your milestones, you have to have the willingness to start over, to change your strategy, to change your plan. Those are the things that I experienced. Those are the things that I would suggest to you. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. Thank you very much, Berge.
Thanks, Dave. That was a great presentation. Um, and uh, uh, I, love, uh, I love the passion that you've uh, engaged in this uh, challenge and uh, the outcome is remarkable. I mean, going from 13 men to a full house and in two years um, is something that uh, uh, is just an incredible uh, accomplishment. So congratulations to you and your team. Uh, brothers, I'm excited. Uh, Dave has agreed to uh, just uh, recently in the last couple of weeks to join our 1848 housing uh, team. And so uh, he's a resource that's available to you. Um, uh, and we're just excited to have his uh, expertise and his passion on the 1848 housing group. So thank you uh, again, Dave, for the keynote and, uh, and the uh, message. Brothers, we're uh, actually doing great on time. We're just maybe a couple minutes uh, past our um, uh, schedule. So let's uh, talk about what's next. So um, what you're going to need to do for the rest of the day is use your conference agenda. That was the um, email that you received. Um, and you'll see links in that to get you to the remaining sessions. All the remaining sessions are going to be done by uh, Zoom and the breakouts. So you'll see that Zoom link um, and Dio uh, curse, run his cursor around the Zoom link, you'll be going uh, to use those links for the rest of the afternoon. So let me just kind of give you a hint if you haven't already figured this out. Um, there are a few sessions that are one-time sessions, uh, including in the first uh, round of breakouts, five things you can do to improve your house corporation is only going to be presented once. The roundtable discussion one on renovation and rebuilds and fundraising is only going to be run once. In the second breakout session, the roundtable for improving house corporations uh, is only op uh, offered once. All the other sessions are offered at least two times. So we wanted to give you an opportunity. We didn't want to have, have you have to make tough choices and say, gosh, I really want to hear this one, but it's only uh, available at the same time that something else is. So you should be able to get at least your top two choices in uh, with the variety of three breakout sessions. So hopefully that made sense uh, to you. So what's going to happen is we're going to wrap up now. Um, you're going to immediately go into your next session um, uh, because there's no break between this and our um, session. Um, and then at the close of the first breakout, we will have um, a break for you to uh, refresh yourself. And then uh, at 1.45 Eastern time, need you to be back into your next breakout session. Then you'll have uh, uh, two breakout sessions. We'll have another short break and then at 325, ask for you to be um, uh, clicking in on the Zoom link to the, um, the closing session. One comment is that uh, we'd encourage you to log into the Zoom session as soon as you're ready. The Zoom session will start promptly at the assigned time, uh, but you'll be uh, waiting for host, the host to start the session. So uh, know that you can uh, click on that link in advance and uh, be ready for that session to start. So brothers, thank you for joining us in our opening session. We're excited for uh, our educational features uh, for the next uh, couple hours and uh, look forward uh, to seeing you in the closing session at 325. Thank you so much.